Kai, for starters, can you share a little bit about your background and your clinical experience? Sure. So um, I qualified as a clinical pharmacist and I worked in clinical practice in hospitals for over 10 years in both adult and paediatric medicine. Um, in 2011-12, I got the opportunity to move into digital healthcare and um, look at electronic systems like automation technologies that helped in the medication management process and also the more advanced uh, systems like electronic medical records that are the more comprehensive systems that contributed to safer practices in clinical patient care. Um, and now I'm working on my own business um, in, uh, in healthcare health tech, and that's looking more at the wider picture of how patients can own their own data and empower themselves um, and allowing to share that data. And I think a lot of this uh, idea around the company has been born of the things that I have seen in my clinical practice around the medication management space and also in prescribing errors and how um, the burden of uh, uh, clinicians in that, but also the consequences on the patients. So I think it was a really important thing to have the clinical and technical background and, and see the use cases that occurred that then led to, to my progression into um, my starting my own company. If we go back to the time when you were still working in the clinical practice, can you name a few examples of medication-related errors that you saw? Yeah, sure. In my, um, in my years in clinical practice, it was quite interesting because uh, one of the, the first big roles I had um, after doing a lot of rotations around the hospital, so this was working in a, in a six to 700 bed uh, tertiary hospital, um, I was given the role as uh, emergency department pharmacist. So it was like initiating the role. So I was there building the role around that. And a lot of that was looking at errors that happened when patients came into the emergency department. So uh, re reconciling their medications, checking off what doctors had written to make sure that all of those drugs were right, validating that against a couple of sources. And during that time, I saw a lot of errors, like about, there was about uh, a study that I did in this particular area showed that 30%, over 30% of errors that were written in hospitals were incorrect when doctors were actually documenting the admission medications. And so that was uh, something that I presented at a conference and also we had a poster around discharge medications as well. So the accuracy of those medications um, as the patient trans transitions through the different parts of healthcare in hospitals and then when I moved into paediatric medicine, uh, that also, we, we looked at reconciliation as the medication safety pharmacist in that role. Um, I looked at a lot of the errors that occurred on medication reconciliation. So things like uh, wrong doses, wrong drug, um, you know, transcription errors between charting medications across from one chart to another. Uh, things like withheld medications not being prescribed. But I think the most concerning thing and uh, for clinicians what scares us the most were tenfold overdoses. So either prescribing a tenfold overdose or missing a tenfold overdose or administering one for nurses. So each party of that is involved in that, uh, that clinical decision making at that point. And I think as a pharmacist I felt like that was quite a big role um, to put into a manual context where doctors are prescribing manually, nurses are, are going off these uh, charts and, and then pharmacists are having to check the charts as well. So uh, I felt that was probably one of the biggest challenges that I had in clinical medicine. Why did this mistake happen according to your observation? How does, you know, a tenfold overdose happen? It has to do with, I think, uh, you know, all, all of the clinicians there, the doctors, the nurses, um, pharmacists, we're all really busy, you know, we're, we're checking charts. Sometimes I had up to 60 patients, you know, which was if, if people were sick and so on. So we're checking a lot of charts. Doctors are really busy as well. They've got huge lists that they're doing. So sometimes it's a lack of knowledge um, and you're relying on memory or you're checking like books and then you're the decimal point goes in the wrong place, for example, and so that, that ends up being a tenfold overdose. Things like morphine and fentanyl or sometimes antibiotics, which you're not familiar with prescribing, sometimes a, the, those doses occur that, you know, they're, they're transcribed onto a, a sheet and then 
um, they have to be checked within a certain amount of time to make sure they're correct. And if you're not always referring back to references and things like that, sometimes you won't pick up those errors. And so that's how we saw uh, the tenfold errors unfolding in, in the hospital scenario. Um, we're all aware of them as well, but sometimes we just miss them. So in your view, what is the role of technology in improving patient-related medication safety? So all of the information at, at, uh, in Perth at that time when I was practising as a clinical pharmacist was done on paper. And I think when I transitioned into the medication safety role, I, I chaired the medication safety committee. And part of my responsibility was look, to look back on those uh, severity of cases related to medication errors. So uh, we had a doctors like infectious disease doctors that were part of that and we looked at everything from therapeutic drug monitoring with high-risk drugs like warfarin, um, gentamicin, vancomycin, digoxin. We'd look at these high-risk drugs and we'd make sure that um, they were there were safe practices around prescribing those and then we would look at other things like how we could um, have cheat sheets available on the drug formulary list for doctors that when there were risk of tenfold overdoses, how they could quickly check the formula formulary and help them prescribe these. But if you can imagine, a lot of this information is um, fragmented and not easy for doctors or, or nurses to find quickly and easily. So that really led us to thinking about solutions of how we could mitigate these risks um, related to prescribing errors. And, and uh, sorry, pres not only prescribing errors, prescribing errors, administration errors and, and medication management across the board as well. What exactly were the best practices that you saw during your research? I started to look at some of the solutions, uh, particularly as a medication safety pharmacist. My role was to, to bring in solutions and, and how would it look into the future? So. Uh, Fortunately, in 2011-12, I was approached by Perth Children's Hospital um, that were building a $1.2 billion hospital, and they were looking particularly at medication management and medication safety. So because my role had been um, informing executives and clinicians and, and, and a real education role, um, part of that then had to transition into how I would look at this across the board and uh, be able to implement safe pra safer practices for, for um, medication safety. And so in 2014, I got a Churchill Fellowship and we were able to travel across and look at um, other systems in other hospitals that would help to make safer practices. So in that, I was able to visit uh, UCSF, um, Wisconsin, uh, in, um, sorry, Wisconsin, and a couple of different uh, premises to actually look at the hospitals and, and see the best practices and also in Israel, and then apply those best practices of how we could use that in, in uh, Perth Children's Hospital. So that allowed us to look not only at the medication management process, but also at electronic prescribing and different aspects. So the most more advanced electronic medical record system as well as uh, the prescribing systems within the hospital. And uh, after the intense work in clinical practice, you actually transitioned to the startup world, more specifically blockchain. Can you tell me, you know, where do you see the role of blockchain in patient safety improvement story? Um, so the best clinical practices uh, that, I, that I saw while I was traveling um, with the Churchill Fellowship were, I visited about five to six hospitals um, that range from the US through to the UK, Israel, Singapore, to, to look at the, the practices that were um, implemented in these and then to see how we could then bring those practices into Australia. So some of the things that I saw were uh, uh, some had a very clear vision and strategy how they were going to implement the systems and the type of systems they wanted to bring in and the problems that they were tackling and also the type of data that they wanted to record and capture through this. So that was a very interesting um, exploration into it and what that showed as well as how they were able to reduce the medication errors in the hospital 
by implementing these best practices as well. So the best practices weren't only based on the digital technologies and, and automation, um, including robotics, medication dispensing robotics that they brought in, but the best practices related to the vision the funding as well was a really important part and the implementation of these systems. So it wasn't only the electronic medication uh, systems that they were implementing, but the wider range. So it could be everything from scheduling through to uh, managing the systems, how, how each of the systems managed, um, uh, you know, dose-related uh, alerts or drug-drug interactions or adverse um, uh, drug event reporting through to, um, you know, uh, closed-loop medication management. So you could scan uh, a barcode on a package to verify that the dose prescribed was the cor correct dose. And that was referred to as closed-loop medication management. So this was a very interesting process around the medication management journey. But I think the most enlightening thing for me was to understand the, um, the integrity of information on medication management is related to the biggest clinical system. So if you have an electronic medical record that in, in integrates all the different parts of hospital medicine and community medicine as well, you have a more robust system and, and less errors and, and greater enhanced efficiencies as well. So I think that was a really important part of that clinical um, journey for me, like really understanding that. And then the other part of it is um, looking at those uh, hospitals that didn't have maybe the, the funding to implement these overall strategies or electronic medical records, but they sort of had to, to get a patchwork quilt together. So put different systems in like that had to integrate but the amount of work and time to integrate these systems uh, with each other and the interoperability challenges were, were really, really hard during this time. I think because of this, we've had a lot of things that have come in around interoperability like FIRE, HL7 standards, Open EHR, and I think that this has made the process of integrating different systems a lot easier. So I won't say that the older systems are now outdated, but we're really looking at different ways to how we want to innovate and, and really go down that technological journey for safer patient outcomes and to, for less burden of, of doctors and executives as well. In, in this space of how do we best care for patients. So that, that was the takeaways that I really got from, from this, uh, this opportunity to explore uh, different hospitals in different countries. So, so I've been doing a lot of work in the blockchain space and I see this as a very new and innovative technology. Of course, it doesn't have all of the answers, but uh, to actually look at this decentralised technology is very interesting in that no one uh, single entity owns that data. And I think the real in, uh, benefits of this technology that I've seen is that um, it's got cryptography, which allows... Um, you know, prevents hacking and, and tampering as well. So it's immutable. And also it allows transparency for the different groups involved in that, that um, in, in the organisation to allow them to have permissions around that as well. And also some of the business logic can be um, incorporated into smart, what's called smart contracts, which can execute some of the decision making around this. And where we've seen this um, really advance uh, the areas have been in the clinical trial space. So, you know, where it comes to patient consent, where there's a lot of parties involved with consent, recruitment, enrolment into clinical trials, and how you keep, you, you get patients to participate in that. And another use case that I've seen that's very interesting as well is the supply chain where you've got um, the medication supply chain where there's a $200 billion industry of counterfeit medications. And particularly now that we're in times of COVID where there's vaccination errors and all of these type of things occurring. Uh, sorry, vax, start again. At this time where there's uh, vaccinations going out and we're looking at how the authenticity of vaccinations um, 
uh, are there as well. So being able to validate that we're getting the correct vaccinations, and this is particularly the case in developing countries. Um, one of the use cases that we're looking at, which is my company, um, Qua Factor, are looking at is around patient health records. So how do patients own and hold their own data and how do they share this with the different parties? And I really uh, think the reason that I came to this was um, that I, I've been working in hospitals and I saw the errors that came into the emergency department. I saw that there were 33% of errors that occurred. And if patients were able to then share their data and information with the emergency physician when they're discharged, their new medications with their doctor or with their radiologist or pathologist or with their pharmacist, for example, then you, you have a single point of truth of that information that can be shared by an entity that owns that information. And so that's really where we saw a benefit of that. And blockchain has a role of how uh, the different parties can participate by sharing that data across those different stakeholders that are involved in the healthcare system. And then eventually, if you want to be enrolled in clinical trials and so on, you can then have that, uh, that link or that portal with the, the clinical trial researchers and the different parties that want access to, to data, but with the consent from the patient. So I think that that's a really important thing is that it's a consensual sharing of data. And this is really where I think privacy, um, ownership of data, uh, ownership or management of data is, is really important as we look towards the future of how um, not only technologies, but how data is transferred through the different sectors. Right, right. So it would have to be um, a, a means that they could update that information with their healthcare provider, like their GP, for example, and have a an updated account of their medication. So when they go into the emergency department and they're sharing that information, it's easily shared and that there's no errors in transcribing or the doctors don't have to spend two hours trying to retrieve the medication from the pharmacist or the GP who are very busy as well but also it's really at 3am in the morning that's not accessible you know and also patients don't remember their medications so to have that in a digital form documented where it can be easily shared but with the consent of the patient and I think I, I keep coming back to that as the important part of how do we um, reduce some of those errors that I saw as a medication safety pharmacist. But also um, the other thing is to build in tools around that, like um, AI tools or machine learning that can help uh, the patient assist them in better ways of looking after themselves. So if they have chronic diseases and, and, and diseases that need monitoring, that they can record daily their their um you know their blood pressure and their 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 heart rate and they can um, their diabetes gl blood glucose level and this type of recording and reporting if there's uh, any deviations from that uh, from those uh, normal normal levels then they can shoot a message off to your GP and and you can have that monitoring occur between your healthcare provider so you don't it it doesn't result in a, an admission to the emergency department because you're tracking those changes and I think that's really moving into preventative medicine and precision med medicine which is a really big part of how we see managing health care so we don't have over, overburdened hospital systems and and healthcare systems into the future where we're looking at ways to reduce that 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 burden for the patient and for the provider Sure. So when I was a clinical pharmacist looking at medications on the uh, on the ward, um, I came across quite a, a significant uh, error or or uh, an error that wasn't detected by the the nurses or the doctor. And I was a clinical pharmacist covering that ward for the day. And I think it was after a weekend as well where we didn't have clinical staff 
um, looking at that every day and you know you have a reduced clinical staff on as well, particularly pharmacists in that scenario. And I came across a drug chart that had vancomycin on it and the patient, and vancomycin is a drug that is an IV, an intravenous drug used for um, severe infections. And we normally monitor this drug on a daily basis, <clears throat> along with uh, drugs like warfarin, digoxin. These type of drugs are what we call um, the, the therapeutic monitoring of these drugs where they can become quickly quite toxic. So in this scenario, I saw the very high elevated level of vancomycin in this patient. And this IV, this particularly IV antibody can create um, kidney complications if it exists in a very high dose in the body. So basically, the idea was that that dose should have been withheld that day and now the patient had an extremely high level of this drug in their body and was starting to get kidney complications as a result of it. So for the, me, this was quite a concern and um, it was documented as an error as well that occurred in the hospital because all the safeguards that were meant to be put in place weren't there. So checking the therapeutic levels, having a purple pen indicate check the level before dosing. So this is how we used to alert doctors and nurses to check levels by putting a purple pen on the page to, to indicate it. So you can see that's very, like it's a very, in a, in a digital age where we have phones and so on, to be able to indicate that this is a really important drug with a purple pen, you know, is as a highlighter is, is really sort of quite archaic. And so, you know, this, this led to us thinking, okay, this cannot be the, our long-term solution on how we tell nurses and doctors to really care for the patient and to critically look after this because what that results in by not caring for that patient properly is an ICU admission. So in a patient ending up in intensive care unit or in a high um, dependency unit, for example, and all the worst case scenario of fatality like death. Like in this case, this didn't happen and we were able to quickly, um, you know, turn things around in this situation. But it's not always the case. And this is the, the I think, the scariest thing as a clinician is is making these errors because everything is with good intention when you're caring for patients. And so you want to be able to be supported by the technology that's in there to look after you so you can better care for patients. And I think that that really transitioned me from the, the place to con, um, clinician to digital health to starting my own business because I felt like I could really participate in in better caring for the patient. I just have one more question for you. Where do you see the future of medication safety related to yeah. technology? Where do I see uh, medication safety and management going in the future is that I really believe um, that if patients are able to, to um, better manage their care or have the tools that are able to be help them better manage their care, then they have a real say in how that information looks like when they transition through the very difficult journey and, and the most vulnerable journey of got, being sick and then having to go to hospital and having to deal with all of the, um, the fear that they're in. So what I, what I would like, like to see in the future is ways that we can reduce that fear for patients so that they feel that they can be better be taken care of in their own home environment by being able to record their medications, getting access to the best health care, monitoring the different aspects of their chronic diseases or the health care, and then being able to communicate that in a way, even if they're, they're not in the best position to communicate it, say that they're critically unwell, that they're able to then digitally communicate that in a way that would get them the best care and attention that they need as they transition through the health, the health care journey. So, so that's that's my hope for the future to see a, a world like that. And just on another point as well, I, I do really also want to see, and I know that it's not a practice now, and it's probably quite a controversial thing to say this as well, but this is part of where we're moving to, and I, and I really believe we're putting our efforts in, when I say where, where um, my business is putting their efforts into, is incentivising patients for data as well. So into the future to see a real model where if, if I have information that is valuable to others, 
then I want to see that incentivized in a way that I can better care for myself as well through that. So that that's a really new thing that's been brought about by this decentralized technology. It's got a, a history in block um, Bitcoin and um, so blockchain, for example, has a history in Bitcoin and and these cryptocurrencies as well. But into the future, we may see an, an a way to tokenize patients for the data that that they um, they're giving contributing to research and design of new innovative treatments and and therapies into the future.